good morning, afternoon, or evening to each of you <laughs> joining us. Uh, today's episode is uh, crossing many time zones, thus the uh, multiple good morning, afternoons, or evenings. And thank you so much to each of you for allowing IIDA the privilege um, of joining you in your kitchens, your living rooms, your home offices, wherever work is happening for you right now. And wherever you are, I hope you're safe, I hope you're well, I hope you're staying strong and optimistic. I'm Cheryl Durst, I'm the Executive Vice President and CEO of IIDA, the International Interior Design Association, and this is episode 10 in our ongoing series of collective design webinars. The series is very generously sponsored by Interface and we thank them. Today, we're spending a bit of time talking about the world of design and how global efforts um, are exemplifying what we're all living and working through at the moment. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Today's program is CEU accredited by IDCEC for one CEU. To receive credit, you must attend the entire webinar. Your credit will be reported within seven business days. If you registered with an IIDA member number, we'll take care of that registration. If you didn't register, please email our education team at contactceu at iida.org and we'll take care of that for you. Um, we'll repeat this information also at the end of the webinar so you don't have to uh, scramble to get a screenshot of this. So this webinar, we're looking to the future. It's clear that designers and design thinking will be incredibly impactful, leading the charge in change to healthcare, to the workplace, to cultural institutions, to hospitality, to education, and of course, to all the places that we call home. You know, it's interesting. We don't have all the answers yet and in fact, we don't even know all the questions yet. But what we do know is that design is forward and future facing always. It's imperative that design is at the forefront of what is now, what is near, and what is next. Today's panel features global design leaders who are going to discuss the state of the industry from their viewpoint and help us all think about what's to come. Please join me in welcoming our exemplary panel. I'm honored that we have panelists from Hong Kong, from London, from Milan, and from West Michigan. Uh, we have joining us today, Julia Monk, an authority and hospitality thought leader. Julia is joining us from Hong Kong. Colin Berry, who's a design principal okay. with Kessler London. Nikolai Grant, who is a design leader for the International Studio of Hayworth, and a shout out to West Michigan right there, Nikolai. Virginia Lan, an award-winning designer, founder and design director of the One Plus Partnership in Hong Kong. And I just had the privilege of presenting a design award to Virginia and her team yesterday. And Hi. who is the general manager of Salone. Uh, in Milan. Absolutely an event that I think we are all missing but are looking forward to attending again in the not too distant future, Marco, yes? Thank you. Waiting uh, for you. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much for joining us. And I want to start our discussion um, by not ignoring what's going on in the world. Um, you know, we are having this conversation, we know in incredibly challenging and unusual times. We are all not just facing this pandemic, um, but also a deep destabilizing political and social unrest here in the US and globally, uh, protesters around the country are supporting the black community here in the US. It's a time of reckoning, I think, for all of us. And we are faced with so many, so many challenges socially and culturally and in our design community. And I wanna start and open up by asking each of you, 
how you're doing, and how can we as a design community collectively address through long-term solutions, equity, justice, and social responsibility. Can I start with you, Colin? Sure, nothing like a really difficult question to, <laughs> <laughs> to start the panel conversation. It is, um, it is a difficult person, question. Yeah, yeah. So first and foremost, thank you so much for, for having me. I'm really, really honored to be with you all and um, certainly with this esteemed group of, of panelists. Um, you know, I really think, you know, being, being here and being somewhat separated from it, you know, every day that I turn on the news or I, or I look online or whatever, you know, it just sort of brings me to, to tears, right? I mean, it's just, um, you know, like seeing what happened in Minneapolis is just completely disgusting and disheartening, you know, and it's not acceptable. And we as a community, you know, both as citizens of the representative countries, the globe, you know, the, glo the global community and, the, and the, you know, of, of, of the interior design and architecture community, we need to stand together, right? And we can't tolerate this. It's not acceptable. Um, and so, you know, we can't just talk about it. We actually need to take action. So, you know, hats off to those that have been demonstrating in the streets. But as one of my mentors said to me, you know, demonstrating in the streets is only one part of it. You know, at the end of the day, we all need to take action. So, you know, what does that look like for you? I mean, it might be as simple as voting. It might be as simple as letting your politicians know. It might be as simple as, you know, giving money to those organizations that are, that are, that are doing things. But at the end of the day, I think we all, um, we all need to stand up, right? And everybody needs to play their part, including the black and brown community, right? They play, they play a part in this as well in terms of, you know, and this may be a little bit controversial to say, but, you know, they also play a part in this. And, you know, we, we all collectively can't keep sweeping these things under the rug and pretending that they don't exist, right? Hopefully at some point, the generation of bigots, um, you know, and, and those that are racist will hopefully be gone. You know, let's hope that that happens in our lifetime. You know, it's certainly gotten better in other parts of the world and in certain parts of the US, but let's just hope and pray that at some point those people, you know, move on, change their minds, have a change of heart, or finally come to, to come to some kind of realization that no matter what, you know, we, we're all the same color. We, are, we all share the same, same DNA. And frankly, you know, this entire thing is completely and totally disgusting. But we do need to play our part in yeah. making change. Yeah, thank you. Um, Julia and Virginia, you're both in Hong Kong, which has seen, Hi. <laughs> yeah, which has seen a fair share of unrest right now even. Um, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about what's happening in Hong Kong and and how design is reacting. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, it it kind of leads back to your previous question, uh, Cheryl, which I think is a very very important question. And I think that the um, I, being an American, am really saddened by all the things that I see going on back home. Um, I, I think it's really incredible. But I also, looking at this from a global perspective, see it as part of just another one of the big disruptors that's happening in our world now. It's been going on for about four years, three and a half, four years. We've been experiencing incredible disruption in all of the, in many, many countries by many, many issues. And um, each country seemed to have its own disruption. Hong Kong had its disruption with the riots and um, the, the threat of China coming into uh, the Hong Kong community years in advance of when it's supposedly supposed to happen. Um, we've seen a lot of disruption in our politics in the United States. There was a lot of disruption in the Philippines when Duarte, you know, took over there. There's been disruption in China. And it, it wasn't as if, and there's been locuses in India, there's been all kinds of things that are happening throughout the globe. And as if that wasn't enough, that each one of our countries was suffering in their own way with their disruptors or dealing with their disruptors, I guess. There all of a sudden we have a global pandemic, which kind of put everything down to a simple common denominator that we're all being disrupted in a terrible, terrible way. Um, generally with disruption comes change and hopefully with that disruption will come positive change. And um, it, my thing about how do we go about solving this is that we can do it one person at a time. And that's if we treat each other with dignity. And if we did that in the conscious sense of every decision that we make and every action that we take to insert the word dignity and how we're going to deal with each other, how we're going to deal with our environment, um, I think we have a really great head off into a solution where we can all operate together as one. We are a global community. There's no getting around it. People can want to cut this 
you know, stop things at the edge of the border, but um, it's too late, cat's out of the bag. We all belong together. And if we don't use this idea of dignity, then we will never have any personal freedom. And I think that's a, a long way to go there. Yeah. And then in Hong Kong, or Virginia, I'll let you take over our Hong Kong issue because um, it, we were already going down before COVID, we had COVID, so yeah. Right. Yes, because yeah, for, for COVID, everybody cannot go out. But for us, I think uh, we couldn't go out for more than a year. And then uh, I just realized that last year at this time I was in Europe and then we were watching, watching uh, the news and then see all the violence and then we were so upset. And then uh, actually uh, it has been uh, going for so long, no matter which, which side you are standing, I think all the people are really upset. And then uh, for us as a designer, we always think, uh, what can we do? What can we do to this society? Is there anything that we can do? But, but we are really not politician, and we don't know. We don't know what to do. We 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 cannot think about any solution to this situation. And then, so just for us, we we think maybe we just focus on design, think about something that can bring people together. Um, to bring the love out of each other, to remind people there is love. I think that is most important. And also in America right now. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we, we think. We, we, we should think of more place that can draw people out of home. I mean, except pandemic, but um, can, yeah, then make people get together and communicate more. I think that's what a, in, an interior designer can do. No, that's perfect, Virginia. Interior design, design is such a powerful tool for change and a powerful force for humanity. Nikolai and Marco, you know, society and culture and design are so intimately intertwined. And from, from your viewpoint on this connection between design and culture and society, can I turn to the two of you now? Um, I'm going to say, Marco, go ahead. Be like, mm, you go, go, go. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, first of all, it's a bit, sur obviously, it's very sort of surreal and very real um, point in time. Um, you know, for myself, you know, I'm from Chicago, so seeing what I'm seeing in Chicago and Grand Rapids is, of course, um, you know, very disheartening. And but it's amazing, it's amazing to see all the action that's, that's occurring and what's happening. At the same time, um, where I live in Grand Rapids, I see more deer than I see people on a daily basis. So even amongst all of this, it's almost like this, this uh, detachment. Um, you know, when I think about kind of some of the comments that have been made and, and around kind of what can design do, and um, you know, I think one thing as creatives and as designers that um, whether it's um, innate in who we are or whether it's been learned. Um, you know, I think there's kind of sort of three elements as far as design in terms of what we're good at and what I think is maybe relevant today. Um, you know, we, we always look at things in more of a holistic perspective, right? What's the, what's the whole? What's the, what's the idea? What's, what's the kind of the goal of and bringing all things together? Um, the other one being um, design is very inclusive. So maybe despite of what you see in the media or sometimes how it's promoted, design is all about bringing things, ideas, people sort of together and how do you work with all these variables and sort of come up with a, with a solution that um, represents, you know, the best of what these ideas are. <clears throat> and I think the last thing is this idea of, um, you know, we, we kind of call it you know, critique, right? But um, I think it's more about reflection. Um, it's more, you know, we're used to doing it in our daily work in terms of if we have a solution, but is this the best one? You know, what can we do better? Um, we can take comments from others and we try and self-critique ourselves. And I think that's a very sort of like reflective process. And, you know, I have a six-year-old, so I guess my ideas are so much around the physical in terms of space or an object, although those are always very important. It can be very impactful. Um, my thoughts are more around education. Um, you know, I have an opportunity now to bring someone along in a, in, a, in a different way, in a different path. I was fortunate enough to be brought up in environments, be it Chicago and other places that are much more diverse than maybe um, experience other parts of the world. 
And um, so I guess from my perspective, it's, it's sort of those tools that we are as, as designers, as, as creatives, and how we can use those to sort of, when it's, whether it's speaking to people, whether it's talking to students, um, you know, those sort of elements in terms of what we do for our daily job that apply at, at more of a at level of people and, and humanity, and not so much just as an object or, or a space. Yeah, perfect. And Marco? Yes, I, I have to say that uh, uh, Salone is an example uh, of how the design community is always together because in those six days of Salone of the Design Week in Milan, we have people coming from 185 countries in the world mm -hmm. and uh, almost 500,000 people uh, staying together uh, from everywhere, staying together for six and seven days and uh, uh, with a lot of energy and speaking together. This is the most uh, democratic uh, example of event uh, that we can see. And all these people together uh, under the, 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 the flag of design. This is what happens during Salon del Mobile. Yeah. And um, uh, it was really, um, we were desperate not to be able uh, to do our edition this year um, and uh, uh, as uh, as usual we prepared a lot of uh, event uh, a lot of installation a lot of uh, example of what could be our life and then it in our life here in Italy or in the United States or in China or everywhere because all the things all the all all, all the languages uh, comes uh, in a in a in a in 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 a certain way, so this is this is a a pity that we could get through. But fortunately, here in Italy, where uh, I hope we see the end of the tunnel of this this terrible uh, COVID nineteen, and uh, life is uh, uh, coming back, and we are already working for next year, yeah. uh, hoping to see all the world, but all the world in a different way that we, of the things that we, unfortunately, we were, we are compelled to see in these days in, uh, in on television, on, on the news everywhere. Yeah, uh, even if, uh, even if uh, we, in the world, I think we have to be prepared in a very, very difficult months uh, yeah. during it, autumn because the economic situation will be very, very difficult. Yeah, and the only true. way, and the only way to face it is to be together, all yeah. together. Yeah. In Europe, Marco, in I love United your, States. I love your point about rallying around a flag of design. And I need somebody to design that flag so that we all have that flag. <laughs> and that, and also that in design and through design, we see humanity. And Nikolai, through the lens of education. So thank you all so much for sharing your viewpoints. And Marco, you teed us up very nicely talking about um, uh, returning to a world, re-entry into the world. And I'd like to ask each of you, um, you know, we're all very uh, concerned right now about what a return to the place, the workplace, uh, to hospitality, what return and re-entry looks like. Um, and it's different, right, in, in many different places. How are things going with return in general in the places where you're working, in the places where your clients are coming back to, or the places um, that unite your partners and your collaborators? Julia, what is, what is return looking like? Well, I'm in a very unique situation because at the middle of last year, I decided to retire from HOK and take a gap year. <laughs> Hello. I was planning on a lot of travel. I was planning on seeing a lot of the places in the world that I hadn't been to before. And all of that is now over, including Solana. It was right on my list. I'm supposed to be there with you, Marco. Um, so my condition is completely different. I just have a... Um, a very introspective gap year going on other than a very uh, travel filled gap year. Perfect, perfect. Nikolai, what is, say, what is 
whoops, I'm sorry, what is return looking like from the, from the Hayworth context? How are you all talking about re-entry and return? It's interesting um, from my perspective because I manage uh, studios in, in Asia, uh, more specifically Shanghai, but also in Europe. So it's been interesting to see kind of what happened with the pandemic in terms of in Shanghai, how it hit, and then how it slowly migrated over. And by the time we got it and we started getting to the middle of it, I'm now having conference calls with designers in AP who are now returning to the manufacturers to have reviews on products. And so this is very surreal, like, wait, I'm at home and I can't go anywhere, but they're now traveling to these manufacturers who are open. And, and then in Europe, it's sort of kind of like, like this in between. And as we know, I mean, AP is obviously, it's not just you know, Asia, it's in terms of like China, it's, for us, yep. it's India, it's New Zealand, it's Australia. So of course, Europe, you know, is the diversity there is you know, immense. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, we're definitely, um, you know, it's, it's happening differently, obviously, for each, for each sector. And, you know, the, the, especially because in terms of environments, commercial environments, how people work, it's quite different as well. So, you know, I mean, you know, we're hearing from clients like, you know, we need more screens, we need more screens to put in between spaces. But in Europe, you're saying, well, we don't do cubicles, we do benching. So we think the use of spaces would be maybe more towards maybe more open spaces rather than trying to bring everyone together back to that bench, you know. If you can work from home, then work from home because we're going to work to maybe more so collaborate. Um, and that's a whole other challenge, right? Because collaboration mm -hmm. is a lot of interaction and you need that sort of cue that you can give one another in order to make the conversation more fruitful. Um, you can do some of that obviously with what we're doing here, Teams or Zoom and things like this. Um, we have other ways to collaborate, but I think yeah, it's been interesting to see globally how we're returning and in, in some cases it's differently for Hayworth and of course different for, for our customers as well. Sure, sure. Colin. Talk to me a little bit about yeah, say, in uh, London and how you're talking about uh, re-entry with your clients. Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, maybe just sort of speaking first about Gensler, you know, we, we are not there yet, you know, much like our clients here in the UK, right, we're still in the midst of this, you know, we're in sort of stage two of a five stage plan, if all goes as planned, according to the government, we will be ideally back to normal by August, but that's assuming that every stage works perfectly and the, our, uh, our value or whatever doesn't, doesn't increase or we, we end up going backwards or, you know. Um, and so <clears throat> at the moment, you know, we're still all working for home as our, as, as, as our clients. The cool thing is that the really progressive ones have actually reached out to us and we're helping them figure out sort of what the interim solution is, right? We have a program, a proprietary software called, software called Rerun, where essentially we run their plans through the software and it essentially shows how they can repopulate based on, you know, a two meter or a six foot, you know, social distancing. And it's interesting because there's, there's, you know, spaces like meeting rooms of 20 people where you only end up with four people, you know, being able to, to sit in those spaces. Yeah. So it's going to be a combination, you know, we believe of, you know, doing this proper planning, making sure that there's proper signage, you know, that there's sanitary stations as folks walk in, um, doing cleaning every evening, but then also sort of staggering the work day, you know, one of the big challenges in London is how do you get people to work? Because most people take public transportation, yeah. right? And, you know, clearly the, you know, the, the tube is not going to be able to take, you know, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that it takes every day, right? That that's going to be cut. So we're going to need to stagger as well. But again, the really, the really progressive clients are figuring this out. And then beyond that, I think is what's really exciting for us as designers, you know, obviously, this has been a really tough time for all of us, right? I think, you know, we've seen a significant decreases in business. And um, I guess the good news is that we're sort of all in that together, you know, no matter how painful it, it's been. And we know, you know, based on the last recession that those affected will land on their feet and we all will land on our feet. And, you know, and I think we're all doing everything we can to help each other. But, you know, our really smart clients, and this is already happening, are coming to us and saying, what does the other side of this look like? You know, we're going to have this interim until we have a vaccine and all the proper testing and stuff in place. But um, what does the other side of this look like? And I actually think that's exciting because it's going to give us huge opportunity. I feel a little sorry for, you know, maybe the broker community because, you know, it may mean that spaces are shrinking, you know, and there's not as much space lease. But for us, 
it's going to create a lot of opportunity and sort of, you know, helping our clients sort of rethink what the workplace of the future will be. And the great thing there is it not only affects, you know, uh, just the physical work set, you know, work settings and creating, <clears throat> excuse me, a better experience for their people. You know, if we're more efficient with space, if we drive up utilization, in the long run, it's also going to be better for the environment, right? So I think that's the thing, you know, there's, you know, seal sightings in the in the Thames, and I think we heard dolphin sightings, you know, in, in Venice, in the canals, like, you know, um, where we are, <laughs> you know, this, this horrible thing that's happened has also been really good for the environment. So hopefully it's a bit of a wake-up call to all of us. It's sort of through proper design and <clears throat> really rethinking the efficiencies and the utilization of the workplace um, that we can also do the right thing for the environment, right? Um, so... I think it is an incredible opportunity. It's not all, it's not all, it's not all bad, right? That, you know, it will create opportunities for all of us to be helping our clients figure out a way forward. Virginia, for you in Hong Kong, obviously you were dealing and, you know, in all of Asia, you were dealing with COVID-19 before many of us. You're at a very <laughs> different point. Oh, no. In, in, you're at a very different point in this cycle. Um, are you talking to your clients about uh, returning to the workplace? Have some of them returned? Are you working in your studio? Okay. Um, it started from uh, the end of January. As, uh, uh, I remember it's a Chinese New Year. Uh, it happened before Chinese New Year. And then, uh, and then uh, it's when Wuhan was locked down and then we were all very scared. And then nobody, even the uh, first day of Chinese New Year, we were like very scared to go out to eat. And then because we, we had SARS in 2003, we yeah. experienced that. We, we have been there before so that everybody is so alert. But that is uh, also very good for us because uh, right when that time, Ajax, my husband, just like searched on internet to order masks right away wow. and then all the sanitizer masks all the thing he just like so pre prepared well prepared and then we were uh good on that side um because actually after 2003 the SARS like in Hong Kong mostly I think all the new uh public toilet we have like this kind of like touchless access to to mm. the the bathroom so we mm -hmm. don't have a door anymore and then all the thing is uh using sensor like sensor faucet sensor stop dispenser like sensor toilet flushing nobody's touching anything and then at at one moment we are we are kind of like sick to that sensor thing because it is sometimes like due to the distance and sensitivity you always it is always not working and that uh, we, we we i mean a lot of people once thinking that maybe okay should we start using sensor anymore but and then COVID is coming back yeah. um okay so th that's why this sensor thing is coming back again okay talking about back to uh what happened during the the the, the uh, end of January. That is Chinese New Year, right? And then we have like a couple of days of a public holiday. And then um, when we have to go back to work, we start to uh, start thinking, what should our staff what should yeah. we plan for our staff? Should they for go back staff, to work? Yes. Actually, there were there, there actually has been no restriction from the government. We we don't need to work from home, but we just uh, ask our staff to work from home because it's dangerous to go outside. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, actually for me, I'm kind of lucky because we moved to this uh, new apartment for a year before, because we, we are like always very hands-on on our design. So right. we always stay in the office, like talking to our staff, like working on design. So we have been working long hours in, in our office. But after we moved to this new place, we uh, got the computer, all this uh, networking all connected so we can directly access to the file in the office. So we are lucky when it comes, we can, we can work from home. <laughs> That's good. We don't need to go out. So I have been at home for like five months. 
so I've been working here for like so long, but like every once in a while, we 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 go back to the office to have meeting with all the staff, and and actually all the um all the meetings with our clients is uh -huh. just Zoom, or just all all Zoom, and um okay, uh, uh one thing I I want to talk about is because yeah. we have been into SARS, so even our client because some of our clients are from Hong Kong. I remember that uh, after the Chinese New Year holiday, we have this presentation. We are thinking, okay, oh no. Um, so uh, are we go? Are, are they going to uh, overrule all our proposal because you know the budgeting or the things? Are, are they going to uh, put put it pending? And then, but our client goes like. Uh, because he's from Hong Kong and he was like, okay, we have been to SARS. We, we know what's happening because after SARS, there is a, a big uh, economic boom. Everybody just went out and buy and shop and eat. Um, so we must spend more money in our shops. So we, they just chose a more expensive option on our design. Interesting. And there was, he, yeah, he was like, it's okay, just yeah. do it because everybody will go out and spend money and that, that was so encouraging for us because yeah. we, we were we were worried about it yeah a lot because you know uh even though we have projects in like middle east and asia but a lot yeah. of our projects from china and then we were thinking okay we will have a lot of projects pending but actually it's it's not actually okay sure some projects are pending but we do have some uh, new clients calling and then they even suggest us to do like virtual site meeting. Okay, so oh, let me oh, let me oh, okay. let me jump in, Virginia, because a couple of things I want to make sure to not um, leave behind. So what you've just talked about is this surge in work. There's this sense of preparedness because of what you've lived yes. through in Asia, yes. but also this new surge in work. And economists are talking about globally this pandemic does create this pent up demand. All of our business cycles are going to shift. We all need to be prepared right, right. for this kind of volatility right. in our business cycles, in supply chain cycles. Um, but what you were talking about from your perspective, you know, as a firm, you're already obviously uh, seeing that because you've lived a bit uh, ahead of the curve of where we are obviously in North America. Marco, as um, someone who works with um, many, many manufacturers, and obviously because you run one of the world's largest design shows, um, I'd love to hear what you're thinking about. How are you going to encourage people to come back to Milan, come back to Saloni? Italy was obviously hit very, very hard. Um, I'm not sure you have to do a lot of encouraging to get people to come back to Italy. So many of us can't wait to come back to Italy, but coming back to a show that's noted, right? We've all seen those photos. We've all been a part of those crowds with thousands and thousands of people. We're all very concerned about uh, distancing and crowds. What are some steps that Salone is taking to encourage people to come back to Italy? It's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, we are working as, a, uh, as an association of, uh, of exhibitions to some, uh, in, 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 a, in a common protocol that we will follow uh, in Italy, but I hope in Europe too, just to have the same rules, same prescriptions, same kind of, uh, situation that you can find here in Milan or in or in Verona, Bologna or in Cologne or Frankfurt or or, or, or in Paris. And this is very important and we are working on this uh, uh, on, 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 on this way very hard. Then the first thing is is uh, to wait for exhibition to start again. I hope uh, I heard that someone started again in China, and I hope uh, this will start again in uh, in Italy, in and in Germany, and someone in Europe in in September and October. And this could be uh, the first uh, step uh, to go 
towards uh, a certain kind of uh, normal situation, if, if, I, if I can use this word, normal. Sure. Um, it's true that uh, maybe for the next months, uh, uh, we have to uh, follow very strict rules and prescriptions just to uh, avoid all risks as possible. But is it true, all the same, that the human being is a social animal? Mm, and true. in the future, we will need to be together because we were born together, we live together, and we need the contact uh, of all the people. Um, it, this will, this, this terrible situation will last for some months, I hope only some months, uh, maybe some years, I don't know. But this is where we have to go back. Fortunately, in this situation, uh, technology helped us a lot. Uh, we all work in smart working. I, I, I spent, uh, fortunately, two months uh, uh, in the mountain in Switzerland because I was there when there was the lockdown in Italy. And I worked, I work hard, I work hard, but I also had the possibility uh, to see beautiful uh, countries. And, uh, uh, but this is, in my opinion, is different. Uh, now I'm in my office in Milan. Next week, we will start to have people again, back again, uh, not mm -hmm. all together, not mm -hmm. all together, but we will start with people that uh, it's easier for them to come to the office with maybe uh, cycling or uh, with a motorbike or something like that. Right. And so we start again. Uh, every firm, every company in Italy has a procedure that you have to follow yes. to avoid risk and contacts. Yeah. And we have all to be very, very careful. But I hope that technology will continue to help us, but uh, it will be a support of our life, yeah. not uh, the center of our life. This is what I hope. Yeah. And I think and design a, will help also. <laughs> yeah. And I think design will help us in this direction. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Colin and Marco brought this up and Virginia brought this up. Um, and amen, Marco, to your saying that as human beings, we are social beings and we need one another. How do we communicate, Colin, safety and security and this place is safe to enter? How, what, are the, what are the signs and signals that we can use? And I'm not talking about window clings and, and signs that literally say come in. What are the things that design can do to help employees, clients, organizations mm -hmm. welcome their teams back to the office? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's sort of seeing, I mean, knowing that your organization has a plan, right? Um, I think we're all gonna be seek, seeking safety, right, as we go back and, and knowing that our organization has a plan and if folks are not sort of following sort of the rules of that plan that there's some kind of recourse in addition to you know even seeing that the you know restrooms are cleaned on a regular basis you know knowing that the the office is cleaned on a regular basis um you know i think that hopefully will give us you know collective peace of mind but i think marco's right i mean we are at the end of the day we're social beings and you know if we just think of last pandemics, whether it be SARS or, or other things, you know, ironically, actually, I went to China during the SARS epidemic, which is quite surreal. And just seeing what they did there compared to what we're, what we're seeing happening in the rest of the world, you know, China, you know, I think, you know, uh, at least I learned a lot about how to do it. So it's even things like making sure that there's you no know, temperature checks and, you know, that kind of thing when you walk into a building, you know, those are the kinds of things that are going to collectively give us, give us peace of mind. Um, you know, I don't know. If Nikolai, if you have other things to add. Yeah, Nikolai, I'd love to open that up to Nikolai, to Julia. What what are the things that design can do to help people feel safe, to have some assuredness about the spaces around them? 
Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> I was waiting for someone. I wasn't sure if it was me or not. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you know, a lot of, we, we always, of course, I mean, we're obviously developing product, but it's always around space. It's always informed by research. And so I think that's still kind of, um, you know, there's kind of this, I don't say a first wave, but the sort of, you know, the initial um, response that I'd mentioned well, you know, previously was you know, this, this thing with kind of, you know, screens and creating division. Uh, creating space amongst people, you know, like Colin mentioned with their program, you know, we here are also looking at, you know, how do we, you know, how do we sort of, um, we look at a space, what suggests that there's this kind of space for us to be, right, in, like in, in between one another, just, you know, to kind of still exist comfortably, um, you know, the certain parameters are being done in terms of, you know, checking when you come into the office, you know, I don't go into, I don't return back to Hayworth HQ until I think a week or two from now, so I'm kind okay. of, sort of the, the steps that I have to take when I come back to the office. Um, others have gone in um, before myself. And so, you know, what we're doing at least is our HR group is communicating, you know, what all those steps are and how we do it and how does it work. Um, you know, you'd hope that other, <laughs> you know, customers and other, other companies are, are kind of taking the same sort of precautions. I think that's sort of kind of like the, th you know, the, the first thing. Um, along with this kind of initial response, but I guess kind of the, you know, the next thing is, you know, how do we kind of move it forward from that, right? How do we, what's going to happen in a couple of months when either do we get more comfortable or do we not, or does anything change, you know, yeah. how's that going to affect things? And um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like we're trying to take these sort of baby steps to get people, you know, comfortable. And I think we're not going to realize what those are until there's enough folks actually in this space to find out whether or not it works. I think there's things like the touch list, which makes complete sense, um, those type of things. But I think beyond that, it's not until we get enough people in the office where it's actually get reach kind of a, a critical mass as to, okay, these things are, are, not, are not working and how do we have to, you know, adjust. I think this kind of organic nature of this opportunity um, is going to require us to really kind of, you know, listen and be careful, you know, and with like the steps that we take. And don't make too many assumptions in terms of what we think people may, how they may feel, but rather really feel to understand it and, and sort of, you know, um, you know, just kind of pay attention and listen as, as you go. It's very, it's very iterative and it's, right. you know, there's right now and then there's what's near to us and then there's what's going to be next year. And I think people are, there are a lot of folks out there who might be presuming the solutions they have in front of them right now may be in place a year from now or two years from now. But I think that's the, the biggest issue is for us to all remain fluid and open-minded and flexible. It's almost like right. this is the largest social experiment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, our and I think observational exactly. skills have to be so keen and there will be decisions about place that will be made within weeks and sometimes on the fly. But your point right. about keeping an eye on these next phases and, and phases is a very good one. Julie, yeah. I well, sorry, one quick point I want to make. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. No, I, but it, I think it's funny because as designers, we live in the gray. We're yeah. gray. Yeah. It's not gray. We're a bit concerned, right? If it's an answer, we're sort of like always questioning it. But yet those who we typically work with, and probably most of us in our organizations might be more on the black and white sort of what they want to see, what they want to hear. They want so how do we, yeah, how do we work the gray into those areas yeah. where people kind of feel comfortable together? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Julia, what can, what can workplace and retail, what can we learn from hospitality? Um, yeah, we've got a great example here in Hong Kong, I believe, and that is that um, leadership and having a plan, as Colin was saying, are two very, very big, important things. And um, a handful of the luxury hospitality hoteliers here in Hong Kong have joined forces with Cathay Pacific, the airline, and created a, um, a special group called the Heritage Tourism Board. Huh. And even though these people have historically been competitors against one another, vying for each other's clients, they've said, wait a second, that's not going to um, help us out of this predicament. Let's join forces and see what we can do to um, really create a sense of stability and vibrancy about what Hong Kong is and what it has to offer if Hong Kongers as well as anybody visiting Hong Kong. So they're going about a campaign right now to talk about all of the great things that we have here in Hong Kong, how they are all um, being made stable. You know, throughout this entire COVID, we've been fortunate, and although any death is bad, we've only had four deaths due to the virus here in Hong Kong. 
which is remarkably a very, very, very low number. Wow. We've had less than 1,200 cases of, of COVID out of a, a population of seven and a half million. So the containment and the um, sense of uh, group that's here and how considerate people were for one another has really prevented that spread along with the experience that happened in ZARS. So this hospitality group has gotten together and they basically come up with a, a campaign. First to sell the vibrancy and stability of Hong Kong to the Hong Kong people so that when the borders open and people can start traveling again, we'll have seven and a half million ambassadors for what a great place this is to visit. Yeah. And then, there's, then from there, they'll branch out and start selling the concept um, as the borders come down to the people who will be visiting in Hong Kong in the, in the future. So they're really focused on um, what's uh, out, the, what can be, what the possibilities are as mm -hmm. the barriers to travel start to break down. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful example of how uh, planning ahead without knowing the specifics of how the um, COVID will react. You know, we, we were locked down, we got everything under control, and then people came back from spring break. We had a little bit of an outbreak. We got all that under control, and now there's been protests again. So we've got a little of our two week period to see if there's any outcome that comes from those first round of protests. Is there gonna be any kind of revival of the, of the virus? So far, um, we haven't heard of anything, but it's possible it could come. I love that point about uh, preparedness and a little bit of what Marco was alluding to, kind of procedure and protocol, but then also being accountable for our own personal responsibility, um, right? Our stake in all of this, that I am responsible for your health and the health of the person who is working six feet away from me um, or in the, same, uh, in the same workplace. So that, that's a good, good lesson to take to heart. Cheryl, this is the main thing. Uh, each each one of us has, has to be responsible for 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 himself and for all all the other people. It, it, yes. it starts from here. Everything starts mm -hmm. from here. From yeah. from 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 our feeling that everyone has to be careful and responsible for for himself. But one of the the main problems that we have to face in the next future, also for, for coming for for let the the people coming to Milan. Is the transportation? This is the main, the main problem that we have to face very, very soon uh, uh, with the the, the 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 reopening of the countries and the transportation. Mm -hmm. This will be the key factor for our life in the next months. Yeah, yeah. That is, there's so much that we have control over in getting from our home to someplace else, getting from our home to our office. But what we don't have a level of control over is transportation. And you're correct, so correct, Marco. That is the largest concern of people, particularly in large urban areas, who are thinking about their return to work. Colin invoked it in speaking about London. It is, Nikolai, you've lived in Chicago, Virginia, you know, um, that is the, one of the largest concerns in Chicago. By and large, people want to get back to life but it's the how we get there. It's that commuting piece that we all still need to solve. We are um, yep. running, starting to run short on time. And there are a couple of questions I still wanna ask you, um, but something that comes up for so uh, very often in this series, um, thinking about your careers in design and the design world, what advice would you give to students? Um, uh, there are tens of thousands of students coming out of design and architecture school and coming into this profession. Um, what advice would you give to students and young professionals? This is a couple of this, uh, this has popped up from a number of folks in the audience. So I want to make sure to, uh, to uh, ask this question. Any advice for students? Yeah, so I, maybe I'll start. Um, I actually yes. graduate, sorry, Nicole. Um, you know, I actually graduated in a recession. I didn't even know what a recession was when I graduated <laughs> from university. I'd never heard of it before. So for those of you that haven't experienced it, this is what, this is what, one, is, what it's like, you know, not the funnest thing in the world. But, you know, um, you know, I just persevered, right? You have to keep the faith, you know, uh, you have to work at it. You have to be persistent. Um, work your network. You know, it's amazing. You know, don't be afraid. I mean, I'm always excited when someone, a student reaches up to me or whatever. It's like, you know, I think that much more of them, you know, because it's like, you know, they, they were brave enough to reach out and that's just a lot about their character. And, 
you know, most of us, you know, what I love about this profession is, you know, the people are incredible. You know, I think, you know, Julia or others said earlier, like, you know, we are an incredible community and we do, you know, I love that as designers, we are open, right? As Nikolai said, you know, we see the world differently. And so don't be afraid to reach out and to ask for help or to, you know, to work your network. So I'd say be, 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 be persistent. You know, that would be, that would be my advice. If it doesn't happen the first time, um, you know, the first, the first place that you apply, you may have to apply lots of places and, you know, and in the near term, you may have to take a job that might not be your ideal, but at some point you will be able, you know, with a lot of hard work and perseverance and determination, at some point you will be able to sort of realize your dreams, which is exactly what happened for me. You know, who would have thought, you know, 33 years on a, in my career that, you know, Genza would enable me to be, to be living and working in London and, you know, that, that I was, you know, made a member of Hall of Fame. I mean, like everything I could have ever possibly dreamt of, you know, what happened. And I know I'm super, I'm really, really grateful for that. Like really grateful, you know, um, but I had a lot of people that helped me and mentored me along the way. So also don't be afraid to, to ask for help or to reach out to those people that, that may be going through these things or, or know more from their, from their own personal experience. That's a, that's a great point. Um, definitely a little patience. And while you were speaking, Colin, a question popped up from the audience. When um, do we think firms will start hiring? I, I know that in Chicago and many other cities, hiring is actually happening now. Um, even though mm -hmm. firms may have hiring freezes, they are still doing, um, they're, they're recruiting strategic talent. There's strategic hiring happening. Um, so the encouragement that I've been hearing from partners, owners, principals of design firms is continue to stay in touch with your connections at design firms, continue to follow up, um, Patience is always a virtue, um, but hiring is happening and will happen. Um, but a bit of patience is definitely required. Nikolai, I think you were going to jump in and say something about some advice to students. Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, first re reflecting on that comment you just made, I mean, the talent pool now is going to be probably larger than it's ever ever been before. Yeah. So definitely, you know, from a from a company, from you know these firms, there's an opportunity now to definitely. I think they're going to want to be looking out for who who's out there, who's looking at them, who do they want to bring? Because now they're potentially there's a greater pool to kind of pull, you know, to, to kind of pull from. Um, but I would, you know, kind of definitely echo Colin's remarks. But also, um, you know, you're now so, so I also graduated during a recession. It was 2002, and I had all these ideas of what I wanted to do, and then I finished school, and there, those ideas were let's say not out the window or, or put on pause. Um, fortunately, I had some very supportive parents who were able to, you know, who were okay. So I figured out what I was going to do or how, what, what my next step was. But you're now given an opportunity to really reflect and look at what it is you want to do and, and, and how do you want to do it and go back in and look at what you had done, you know, in, in school and what might you change, what might you modify, what other things would you want to edit or, or, or put in there and improve necessarily your portfolio or think about you know, the, the, the ideas I had about what I was going to do are those still the ideas that I, that I want to do. There's something else now that I want to shift to. So even though it's, um, it's, it's obviously a negative thing that you're not just jumping in from one position to another, you're not given sort of that, that time to reflect. And I think that can make you a stronger uh, individual, a stronger designer, um, and take advantage of that time that you're now being given um, yeah. rather than, you know, um, try and quickly sort of, um, you know, find a, find a solution. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to I wanna build on that just for a sec. Go ahead, Sorry. I'll be talking to you fast. You know, I think this is an incredible time to self-actualize, right? So if the work isn't there at the moment or you're not that busy or whatever, you know, uh, it's an incredible time to really get to know yourself. You know, I've been really lucky. I've, you know, all of last year, I traveled and traveled and traveled and traveled and it was like my head was just spinning and, you know, I mean, I've been really fortunate to just sort of take this time and, you know, really think about, you know, am I happy? Am I doing things that I want to be doing, right? I could be dwelling on the sort of scary things or, you know, the other things, but I think dwelling on the positive and, and really, you know, I think Tom Durenso shared a quote, you know, which is actually Saul Walensky, like, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? Yeah. So it's like using this time to self-reflect and to ask yourself if you're doing things that you are happy doing to figure out what's important to you in your life, right? Is this the career that you want to be doing? You know, are there other things, you know, now is the time, you know, take this opportunity to 
to push the reset button a little bit and and figure it out you know figure it out what it is that you want to be doing in the future you know there's there's no better time than now we've got about five minutes left and we want to we it's been our tradition to end each episode on notes of optimism and so i would love for you all to think for two seconds and provide some closing comments and because i so love the idea of a gap year um gap year <laughs> just start for for 20 year olds <laughs> have me seriously think okay. about gap years, Julia. like that that's my that's going to be one of my takeaways um yeah. i would love to start with you and then we'll move quickly through and then we'll have to move quickly to a close so julia words of optimism i think we're living in one of the most exciting times it's been around probably for the last 100 years and we may be going through a great deal of disruption right now but once we get to the other side of this i think we're going to have a fantastic world with an incredible amount of opportunities perfect thank you virginia give us some optimism um, I think it is a very bad time, but in another way, it's a very good time for families to get together uh -huh. because this is like the first time ever that I stay so much, I mean, spend so much time with my daughter, mm -hmm. that I know her so much more. So I think this is a very good time. So I uh, treasure this moment. Uh, you are going to be very, very busy later. And then you, if you want to be busy, you can have it anytime. Okay, I love that. so treasure this I moment. Okay. I love that your word of optimism came with a warning. You are, but that, that is optimistic. <laughs> I love that. Marco, give me, some, give me some Italian optimism. Italian optimism is uh, that the next year we have the 60th anniversary <laughs> of Salone. So I hope to have all, all, all you to visit Salone with us in a, in a safe way and uh, we are trying to uh, to organize the best salon ever and uh, uh, i think and i know that all the all the, the our our exhibitors will do their best uh, to do an uh, an, uh, an unbelievable uh, event in milano oh, and right. i want to it say another be. thing i remember when i was a little kid in the in the 70 uh, it was the 70s were years very very tough uh, like now very difficult with a lot of crisis but a, lo a lot of creativity and inspiration in music uh, in arts uh, in mm. culture everywhere right. so we have we, i hope this period uh, will help us uh, in all those kind of things beautiful tutto perfetto uh, Nikolai, <laughs> Nikolai, some wisdom from your Chicago roots via Berlin sure. back to West Michigan. Give me some good yeah. Midwestern optimism. Midwest, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm a, mid, a Midwestern or not, but uh, <laughs> but you know, real real quick, you know, I've never had so many custom Lego projects with my son as I do now. Um, you know, when it comes to Salone, <laughs> Midwest. Uh, that was my early spring, so I'm very disappointed. Of course, I mean, you know, kind of put light on it on on the topic, but that was my early spring, and so that was taken. Um, but um, you know, I, I I think I think overall, I think what's what's very interesting, and and Julia, Julia even pointed to it, was that when we just had the COVID, when we the the discussions and the and the topics around design, around space, and all that would have been sort of that dimension. Now that we have a sort of the, what's happening with the social unrest, there's kind of this other dimension to it. And I think the, the optimistic part of that is that the conversations are happening almost more, more holistic now. Because mm -hmm. now as designers, we're not the only one asking these questions. Everyone is asking these questions. So when we bring kind of these bigger yeah. states, bigger ideas of conversation, it's going to be so much more of a, a stronger, more fruitful story. I just hope that we can take, you know, it, it's, a, it's a matter of, um, seizing the opportunity and taking advantage of it. Um, Cause obviously, you know, we all want to get back quick, but we have to do it, you know, kind of in the right way. So, you yeah. know, I think as, as being a Midwesterner, we're in this, <laughs> we're, even though we're, we're in the middle, it's all bringing things kind of together. Uh, everyone's welcome. And so I would say from the Midwest perspective, it's sort of, it's sort of that, let's bring everyone together and kind of come with a better holistic. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. 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 Th
I love that. Yeah. And it's, it's how we're going to tell this story. Colin, exactly. you've got seconds to <laughs> yeah, I know, I second. give us um, some optimism. I would just say sort of building on what, yeah, I think what Nikolai said is right on. You know, we're, we, what I love about all this, right, and everything that's happened is that, it, you know, I do think that we now get that we're all in this together, right? It is going to bring us together. You know, we are one big global community, and um, we will get through this together. It's brought us together. And I think sort of to bring it home to our profession, we are really, really lucky to be doing what we do, right? And you can just tell it's like I've never met the folks on the, on the call except for you, Cheryl, right? And, you know, I already feel like I know you and I'm close to you. And that's, that's, that is what this, this incredible community is that we're all part of. And we will persevere and we will lead the way. You know, as right. designers, we have the creativity and the intelligence to know how to take us forward and we will we will be part of leading the change and we need to you know and we will we will rise to, to make that happen yeah. so thank perfect. you cheryl and thank you perfect. for the idea yeah perfect end note thank you so much to each of the panelists um i love your end note that design will lead it always has it always will we will remain undiminished and strong thank you all so much here's the ceu information again and to all of you listening in <laughs> Thank you for your support. Be strong, be well. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very much. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Interface. Thank you, Ciao. Ciao.